blessings in Yah or English God, in Yahushua HaMashiach or English Jesus the Messiah. This is Salt and Light, your voice for biblical encouragement and teaching from the word of Yahuwah. Let us as followers of Yahushua be the salt and the light as in Matthew 5, 13 to 16. This is where truth is told and discussed so your eyes may be open and you be set free and have your minds renewed. I pray everyone is safe and well. I pray everyone had a blessed and safe New Year's. Um, Happy New Year. It's 2023. For those who are new to this podcast, welcome. And for those who are returning, welcome back. It's great to have you. So online is available on Getter, MeWe, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Visit my pages on social media. We have two links posted. One takes you to the website where you can choose how to listen. We're available on Google Podcasts, Pocket Cast, Radio Public, Spotify, Podbean, Stitcher, Deezer, Buzzsprout, Good Pods, Castro, and Castbox, and many more. The other link is to Patreon, so if the Lord so touches your heart to give and support this ministry, we do bless you for it, and we appreciate you. So when Light comes to you from AlitU, please feel free to download the free AlitU app. Don't forget to subscribe to Salt and Light channel on YouTube as well, and give it a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button. Please like and share the link. Please visit Salt and Light podcast group page on Facebook and YouTube. Also, a Salt and Light art group page on Facebook as well to see pics, reels of past and current paintings and art projects. Your support helps reach more people for the kingdom of Yahuwah and to level up as a podcast and to grow this ministry. Once again, thank you for your support and your prayers. We all need encouragement right now. Be blessed and be, be safe in the name of Yah. I love you all. Praise Yah. So here we are in 2023, a new year, and I pray that the Lord did many, many miracles in 2022 and you know that he's going to do many, many more. And you believe him for many, many more um, in this new year. So um, I just pray everyone is safe and well. Um, see, I didn't do an episode Saturday, so that's why I'm, I'm bringing you uh, this episode um, during the week. And I'm just blessed to have this opportunity. Um, uh, we wrapped up the... The last episode was on chapter, the last chapter of the book of Revelation. We're still in the series of uh, discussing the book of Revelation and just unpacking it. Um, this is the first episode in the seven letters to the seven churches. So um, this is the first letter. Um, so we're just backtracking now to towards the beginning of the book of Revelation. And this is chapter two. And this is the first letter where Jesus, you know, gives the John the revelation and tells him what to write. Um, this is the the letter to the church in Ephesus. Um, there is something also um, mentioned here, and I'm just going to discuss what that means. Um, in the uh, and we'll get to it um, when Jesus and and Jesus mentions this group called the the Nicolaitans, um, he mentions them twice. So I just want to touch on that and, and kind of address that, like who, who he's referring to and why uh, he hates what they do. Uh, I think that's kind of important to uh, just understand and give us some context, um, and, you know, obviously who, who they are, because he does mention them in chapter two, and he does mention them in the letter to the church in Ephesus. So um, I'm going to be reading from the Hallelujah Scriptures. Um, there's quite a bit of information, quite a bit to unpack, so I just want to um, to dig into it. So this is, again, from the Hallelujah Scriptures. It says, to the messenger of the assemble, assembly, uh, or to the messenger or angel of the church of emphasis, right? He who is holding the seven stars in his right hand, who is walking in the midst of the seven golden lampstands says this, I know your works and your labor and your endurance and that you are not able to bear evil ones and have tried those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them false. And you have been bearing up and have endurance and have labored for my namesake and have not become weary. Verse four, but I hold this against you that you have left your first love. So remember from where you have fallen and repent 
and do the first works, or else I shall come to you speedily and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have, that you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Ruha or spirit says to the, to the assemblies or churches. To give him who overcomes, I shall give to, to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of Elohim. And to the messenger or angel of the assembly in Sperner, right? Okay, so we'll stop there. So that's just, uh, so verses, uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, okay, is is uh, discussing the church of emphasis. So, so we'll stop there because um, this episode is only going to deal with that one letter. Um so again, who is the Nicolaitans that Jesus mentioned? So the church of emphasis is the loveless church. So obviously we'll be, you know, taking it uh, one letter at a time and just unpacking it. And um, so each, each letter, each church, Jesus Christ critiques. Um, and I believe it's only the church of Philadelphia that he doesn't, he has nothing negative to say about them. So, um, so there's six churches that, you know, he, he has something, he sees some good things, but he also sees something, some things obviously that need to be addressed. And in the church, the letter to the church in emphasis, he writes, you know, it's pretty hard, you know, it's pretty harsh. It's, it's, you know, to warn you. It's, he says, "Do you have left your first love, um, meaning him, and he's wanting them to repent or else he's going to take take away their place. So that's, that's again, um, pretty harsh. He said, remember, therefore, in verse 5, remember, therefore, where, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. So, you know, again, lovingly, he's pointing out um, what, what they're doing wrong. Um, and, and, you know, what, what they need to fix. Um, and what they need to do in order to fix it, they need to repent. Um, so and come back to their first love. So um, I just want to and discuss before again before discussing any like other views and, and and things like that because again even the seven letters to seven churches are it's quite a bit to unpack um you know just with the different views many people didn't you know just different interpretations and different things so um but i just want to again discuss who is the nicolation so buried Buried in a letter to the Church of Emphasis, and obviously Revelation chapter 2, John has a number of remarks against this church or assembly located in a city that had a famous temple to Diana, the Roman version of the Greek god, god a small g, Artemis. Emphasis compared to a number of other assemblies that received letters in Revelation and had quite a few good marks from Yahuwah. Aside from growing a bit stagnant in their fervor for God, they have resisted wicked practices, endured, endured persecution, and weeded out false apostles from destroying their church. The letter also makes one more positive remark. They hate the practices of a group called the Nicolaitans, which Yah also appears to hate in Revelation, Revelation chapter 2, verse 6. Although it's not out of the ordinary for Yahuwah to hate practices of pagan groups, such as the child sacrifice of the Canaanites um, in Leviticus chapter 20, verses 2 through 5. This group mentioned seems to stand out from other sects that have arisen in scripture and throughout church history. Nicolaitans have drawn a great deal of scholarly debate because much known about the group still lies in obscurity. Why did Yahuwah hate the practices of this group so much? And how did they make their way into revelation in history and possibly found their way into our society today? Nicholas, a possible founder of Nicolaitans in the Bible, who was Nicholas. The Nicolaitans appear 
to come from a sect group at the time that followed a man by the name of Nicholas. His name can derive from a Greek root meaning conqueror or destroyer. Some think Nicholas is the same man who appears uh, to convert to Christianity in Acts chapter 6, verse 5, but lost his way to a teaching known as Gnosticism, a heretical teaching that swept away many members of the assembly in the second century. But nothing more than the roots of his name seemed to link him to the sect that seemed to play the church of emphasis. If, however, the Nicholas and Antioch mentioned in Acts begin, began the sect of the Nicolaitans, he seems to have fallen away from his faith. Revelation was written long after Acts, and perhaps during that time, Nicholas fell in love with idolatrous teachings and chose those over the, sun, over the ones of Christianity. That seems to align with the fact that Nicolaitans buckled under the pressures of Roman rule, lost their faith, and seemed to want to drag other Christians along with them. Doctrines and practices, and who, who were the Nicolaitans in the historical context? Later in chapter 2 of Revelation, the author seems to link the practices of the, the Nicolaitans with the practices of those who listen to Balaam in Revelation 2 chapter, um, later on in, uh, in the chapter in verses 14 15. Those who follow Balaam back in Numbers used Min Midianite women to seduce the men of Israel and lead them to worship other gods. Examples of such acts have played out with Solomon, for instance, when his wives from pagan religions led him astray and after other gods in 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 1-5. through 5. Because Revelation seems to link Balaam with the Nicolaitans, one can assume the Church of Emphasis face a similar dilemma. Immersed in pagan Roman culture in that city, the sect of the Nicolaitans may have attempted to woo the Christians away from their religion, just as they had been wooed before. Nicolaitans also appear to eat food offered to idols, which acts appears to decree against in Acts 15, um, verse 29. Although this one doesn't seem like a major offense, in their context, they had committed a serious spiritual crime. Roman rule required sacrifice to their gods. Emperors such as Decidus uh, attempted to weed out Christians by enforcing sacrifices to various Roman deities. Those who resisted faced persecution and possible execution. The Nic Nicolaitans appeared to conform to this Roman culture and seemed to encourage Christians in Ephesus to do the same in a time of dire persecution in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. In eating the food given to the idols, this implies they had gone to the temples to receive this food and would have had to engage in the immoralities there to acquire this meat. They seem planted in the Asia Minor region to test the faithfulness of Christians in times where it seems that loyalty matters most when physical and spiritual life and death are on the line. The Nicolaitans now, although the sect of the Nicolaitans seems to have disappeared into histor historical obscurity, ideologies of this group seem to persist today. In American culture, Christians now face a choice to blend in society or stand out in this culture of compromise. Many people in the church today, like Solomon, attempt to marry several wives in a spiritual sense. We serve both Yahuwah and money and whatever else idol, but we can only serve one master. Our culture is reaching a tipping point where we, where we do have to choose who we will follow. It requires sacrifice. We can serve gods or Yahuwah. And if we choose the latter, like the Church of Ephesus, we resist the Nicolaitans and their attempts to drag us with them in acts of idolatry and immorality. Praise God. So again, like I, I just like I said, I just wanted to um I just wanted to talk about that, clear that up a little bit, give give it some context. Um, we're just going to dive into just the discussing a little bit of the Church of Emphasis, uh, again, for even more historical context, and it helps us just to better understand, um, you know, these churches back, back in history. Um, Emphasis was an ancient port city whose well-preserved ruins are in modern-day Turkey. The city was once considered the most important Greek city and the most important trading center in the Mediterranean region. Throughout history, Emphasis survived multiple attacks and changed hands many times between conquerors. 
It was also a hotbed of early Christian evangelism and remains an important archaeological site and Christian pilgrimage destination. But where is Ephesus? Um, Ephesus is located near the western shores of modern-day Turkey, where the Aegean Sea meets the former Estria of the River Kestros, about 80 kilometers south of Izmir, Turkey. According to legend, the Lyonian priest Androclus founded Ephesus in the 11th century BC. The legend says that as Androclus searched for a new Greek settlement, he turned to the Delphi, Delphi oracles for guidance. The oracles told him a boar and a fish would show him the new location. One day as Androclus, Androclus was frying fish, over an open fire, a fish flopped out of the frying pan and landed in the nearby bushes. A spark ignited the bushes and a wild boar ran out. Recalling the oracle's wisdom, Androclus built his new settlement where the bushes stood and called it Emphasis. Another legend says Emphasis was founded by the Amazons, a tribe of female warriors, and that the city was named after their queen, Ephesia. It's a uh, temple of Artemis. Much of Emphasis' ancient history is unrecorded and sketchy. What is known is that in the 11th century BC, Ephesus fell under the rule of the Lydian kings and became a thriving city where men and women enjoyed equal opportunities. It was also the birthplace of the renowned philosopher Heraclitus. The Lydian king Creonus, who ruled from 560 BC to 547 BC, was, was most famous for funding the rebuilding of the Temple of Artemis in Ephesus. Artemis was the goddess of the hunt, chastity, childbirth, wild animals in the wilderness. She was also one of the most revered Greek deities. Modern day excavations have revealed that three smaller Artemis temples preceded the Croesus temple. In 356 BC, a crazed man named Herostratus burned down the temple of Artemis. The Ephesians rebuilt the temple even bigger. It was estimated to be four times larger than the Parthenian and became known as one of the seven wonders of the world. The temple was later destroyed and never rebuilt. Little remains of it today, although some of its remnants reside in the British Museum, including a column with Croesus's signature. All right, so um, in, in 546 BC, Ephesus fell to the Persian Empire along with the rest of Anatolia. Ephesus continued to thrive even as other Ionian cities rebelled against Persian rule. In 334 BC, Alexander the Great defeated the Persians and entered Ephesus. Upon his death in 323 BC, one of his generals, Lysimachus, took over the city and renamed it Arsinia. Lysimachus moved Ephesus two miles away and built a new harbor and new defensive walls. The Ephesian people, however, wouldn't relocate and remain in their homes until Lysimachus forced them to move. In 281 BC, Lycomasis was killed at the Battle of Crepinium, and the city was renamed Ephesus again. In 263 BC, Ephesus fell under Egyptian rule along with much of the Seleucid Empire. The Seleucid king Antioch. Antioch um, III took back emphasis in 196 BC. However, after being defeated at the Battle of Magnesia six years later, emphasis fell under Pergamon rule. Interesting. In 129 BC, King Attalus of Pergamon left emphasis to the Roman Empire and his will, and the city became the seat of the regional Roman governor. The reforms of Caesar Augustus brought emphasis to his most prosperous time, which lasted until the third century AD. Um, here, let's just say Christianity and emphasis. Uh, according to some sources, emphasis was at the sec at the time second only to Rome as a cosmopolitan center of culture and commerce. commerce. Emphasis played a vital role in the spread of Christianity starting in the first century AD. Notable Christians such as St. Paul and St. John visited and rebuked the cults of Artemis, winning many Christian converts in the process. Mary, the mother of Yehusha, is thought to have spent her last years in Ephesus with John. Her house and John's tomb can be visited there today. Ephesus is mentioned multiple times in the New Testament and the biblical book of Ephesians, written around 60 AD, 
is thought to be a letter from Paul to Ephesian Christians, although some scholars question the source. Not every Ephesian was open to Paul's Christian message. Chapter 19 in the book of Acts tells of a riot started by a man named Demetrius. Demetrius made silver coins featuring the likeness of Artemis. Tired of Paul's attacks on the goddess he worshipped, he worried that the spread of Christianity would ruin his trade. Demetrius plotted a riot and in entice a large crowd to turn against Paul and his disciples. Ephesian officials, however, protected Paul and his followers, and eventually Christianity became the city's official religion. All right, so there's, um, it's quite a bit. Um, again, I'm not going to go, it, you can look it up, you know, look up each church, study the book of Revelation, the seven letters to the seven churches is just really, really robust and rich in in historic, you know, in in the history. Um, you could you could look it up. You could look up the church. Um, you could look up emphasis in the region, and get a, a whole bunch of uh, information. You know, it says another one, according according to legend, emphasis uh, was founded by the tribe of the Amazons. Again. Um, some debate there. Great female warriors, the name of the city is thought to have derived from Apasis, the name of the city in the kingdom of Arzawa, Arzawa meaning the city of the mother goddess. Some scholars maintain that the sign of the Labrys, the double axe of the mother goddess, which adorned the palace at Conus Creek, originated in Ephesus. As Labrys was associated only with female deities in Crete, it is possible that it was originally associated with the goddess Artemis in Ephesus, whose temple there was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. All right, so you know, again, a lot of a lot of history, a lot of information can be found. Um, and yes, the um, Ephesus is obviously there's a book in the Bible called the uh, Ephesians, and um, the book. I'm sorry, the region of emphasis itself is also mentioned um, in the book of Acts. Um, you know, so you go back and just read it, um, you know, study it uh, at your leisure. Um, I'm just going to dig into just a little bit of what we have here in the... Um, chapter 2. It just discussed the seven churches overall. The seven churches addressed were actual churches in the cities mentioned. They are representative of all churches of that time, as well as churches in all subsequent generations. The letters are to be interpreted historically, pastorally, and practically, with immediate application, instructing the seven actual Asian churches with ongoing application to all local churches throughout church history giving discernment as to where they stand spiritually before Adonai, or the Lord, with ongoing personal application, exhorting the individual to be an overcomer. The structure of the letters falls into a sevenfold pattern. Number one, a commission to the messenger of the church named. Number two, a character description of Christ, a Messiah. Number three, a commendation with the exceptions of Sardis and Laodicea. Four, a censure with the exceptions of Smyrna and Philadelphia. Number five, a correction with various imperatives. Number six, a challenge repeated seven times, beginning with the fourth letter, the challenge follows the covenant promise. And number seven, a covenant promise, which is a facet of Messiah himself and is a gift to every member of the body of Messiah. So um, dispensational interpretation, dispensationalists see a prophetic application in the letter, suggesting they also outline seven stages of church history, indicating the general nature of the church during each given era. Era. Um, emphasis, um, an unloving Orthodox church in the foremost city of Proconsula, Asia. And according to tradition, the residence of John before and after his imprisonment imprisonment on Pot Patmos. Uh, the dispensation interpretation, the Ephesian church represents the church at the close of the first century. So um, then uh, verse five, I will come to you is present tense, referring not to the second coming, but to a spiritual coming in blessing or in judgment. Remove your lampstand. 
where Messiah says that a congregation may continue to exist without being light in the darkness. The name Nicolaitans is symbolic, meaning conquering the laity. Apparently, this group claimed some kind of superior status that permitted idolatry and immorality. Um, verse 7, overcomes, is a military terminology suggesting combat against the forces of the evil one. All believers are overcomers, but those who remain faithful in the midst of persecution and doctrinal error give proof to their faith. This is, praise, praise Yahuwah for that. This is the primary emphasis in Revelation. The tree of life symbolizes spiritual sustenance to maintain eternal life. Paradise is a Persian word for garden, which was used to designate the heavenly garden of, of Yahuwah. The symbolism suggests that perfect fellowship with Yahuwah and human beings enjoyed in Eden before the fall, and that they will again enjoy in the consummated kingdom. So praise Yah for that. Um, just to kind of just discuss a little bit of the different interpretations, <clears throat> the seven letters. The historic approach, you know, what is the significance of, of Messiah's commission to John? What do the seven churches signify? Um, you have the historic approach. John is given a vision of Messiah who announces that he is the right of things that would soon begin to take place and which would extend through the entire age of the assembly. Seven assemblies in Asia received these letters, but they represent seven periods of church history each exhibiting the special features of the respective original church. Preterist approach, Messiah appears to John of Patmos, considering him, commissioning him, rather, to write things that would soon afterward find fulfillment in the fall of Jerusalem. The letters reflect the conditions prevailing in seven churches in the Roman providence of Asia prior to the Jewish war of AD 66 to 70. Futurist approach, by a prisoner on the Isle of Patmos, John sees a vision of Messiah, commanding him to write of events that would be fulfilled at the end of the present age, just prior to the second coming. Some futurists take the letters in the same manner as do the historists, while others take them more as do the preterists or those taking the idealist approach. The idealist approach, the symbolic vision of Messiah, depicts his glorious character and sovereignty, conveying Messiah's sovereign involvement in the affairs of the world and of the assembly, including his intimate concern for his suffering servants. The assemblies resembled, resemble um, assemblies that might exist at any time throughout the church age, and the letters are applicable to any churches that may share their conditions. The number seven is symbolic, suggesting application to the whole Christian church of all ages. Praise God. So, we just get to uh, chapter two here. Um, yeah. The letter to Ephesus. To the angel of the church of Ephesus, write these things, says he who holds the seven star in his right hand. All right. So we read this uh, verses one through seven. Um, With a population of approximately 250,000, Ephesus was the largest, most important city in the Roman province of Asia. The city was devoted to the cult of Artemis, which is Latin for, in, well, Latin, uh, the Latin for that is Diana, and had a temple to the goddess that was regarded as one of the seven wonders of the world. The Church of Ephesus had been established by Paul, who continued to minister there three years after its founding in Acts, that's in Acts chapter 20, verse 31. In addition to Paul, Ephesus had benefited from the personal ministries of Apollos, Apollos, um, Priscilla, and Aquila, and Timothy, who was residing there when Paul sent him the two letters found in our New Testament. John probably li had lived there before being banished to Patmos. No doubt he was eager to hear what Yahushua would have to say to those at his home church while he was in exile. The reference to Messiah as one, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands may call attention to the fact that while the church's heavenly existence is secure in the sovereign care of Messiah, he must visit the earthly counterparts to inspect and correct their conduct and attitudes. As a priest in the temple tends the lamps to keep them from growing dim or going out, Messiah moves among the churches to attend to the purity and brightness of the light they give to the world. 
Messiah affirms his knowledge of the church's positive traits. There was no defect in their labor, patience, or intolerance of those who are evil. They were exercising discernment to, toward those who say they are apostles and are not, and had uncovered some frauds. Paul, in his final visit with this church's elders, had forewarned them of wolves that would arise to harm the church. In the second century, Ignatius, bishop of Antioch, commended this church for its loyalty to the truth that had effectively prevented any false sect from bargaining, from gaining a hearing among his members. In particular, a group of false teachers called Nicolaitans had attempted to insinuate themselves into the church fellowship, but had found the shepherds alert and had been exposed. A tradition having the support of some of the early church fathers identifies the Nicolaitans with the following of followers of Nicholas, who was one of the seven men selected to serve the church in Acts 6 5, but later became a heretical teacher. Some modem commenters, um, for example, F.F. F. Bruce, suggest that Nicholas was a disciple of the Gnostic heretic Serentius. However, the Nicolaitans may have been, whoever the Nicolaitans may have been, their teachings compared in verse 15 with that of Balaam, who advocates sinful license and idolatrous practices and sexual immorality. Yahushua shared the Ephesian church's hatred for this movement, which also has some advocates in the church of Pergamos. Though the Christians had not been had not become weary in well-doing, they had become negligent in the most important era. You have left your first love. In verse 4. Whether love of Yahuwah or of one another is intended is not specified, though the two likely are not to be sharply differentiated. The loss of love is no minor defect, but constitutes a fallen state of the church, requiring that they repent and do the first works, if they are to avoid the threatened judgment. Their present labor, which was not lacking in quantity, differed from the first works by the absence of the first love, which had driven the earlier works. Like Martha, a church may become so engrossed in religious work that it neglects the one thing needed. That's in Luke chapter 10, verse 42. No amount of religious orthodoxy, labor, or loyalty can make up for a deficit in Christian love. The warning that, that Messiah will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place can hardly refer to a second coming and almost certainly speaks of the total extinction of the church in that location. Indeed, today there is no city or church in the Turkish location that was once Ephesus. Islam has been established in this region that Paul had once thoroughly evangelized in Acts 19, verse, five, uh, verse 10. How different might the history of that region have been had the church continued to practice his first love? As Yahushua frequently has said to his disciples while on earth, he now says to the churches, he who, he who has an ear, let him hear. But since the voice of Messiah is now communicated through his abiding spirit, the statement is modified slightly. Let him hear what the Spirit says. Though each church received its own personalized letter from the Lord, the message of the Spirit is directed to the churches collectively. The Spirit of Yahuwah still has relevant warnings in these letters to churches in every place and time. Each letter, each letter contains a promise to the believer who overcomes. Though it is not specified precisely, what is to be overcome. John's other writings speak of both Yahushua and the believer overcoming the world. This implies the continued successful resistance of the world's corrupt moral and spiritual influence. Five of the seven churches will begin to exhibit a worldly spirit in one respect or another, but all seven had some within them who were at least capable of resisting the corrupting influence in order to gain the prize. In this case, the prize will be to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of Yahuwah. The name paradise, from a Persian word meaning pleasure park, had originally been applied to the Garden of Eden in the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament. It was the location of the original tree of life. After Adam and Eve fell, Yahuwah barred sinful man from access to the fruit of this tree, the eating of which would have conferred eternal life. In the New Testament, Yahushua and Paul apply the term spiritually to the place of the de departed spirits of the faithful. 
in Luke 23, 43, 2 Corinthians 12, 4, and in Revelation 22, verse 2, the tree of life is seen growing in the New Jerusalem. Thus, the promise to the overcomer translates into a guarantee of life in the eternal state following the resurrection. Among historians and some futurists, Ephesus is said to represent the condition of the church of the apostolic age until the end of the first century. Praise Yah. Um, we'll just look here again um, to the church in Ephesus. Um, there, you know, can, in the letter, there's praise for their hard work and perseverance. The critici criticism, they forgot their first love. Um, exhortation is to repent. The reward for repenting uh, would be authority to eat from the tree of life. Praise God for that. So, again, you know, the there's a lot, you know, to unpack, and we can go on and on and on. But if you're interested, just do a, a study. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a really, we have to examine ourselves, obviously our own walk. The, the Word of God says to, um, you know, just to examine your walk, um, to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But collectively, as a church, as the assembly, which we are all a part of, we are all members, we are all different members, but of the same body of which the Messiah is the head. Now, you know, that's why I always stress um, the times that we're living in and for us, how important it is for us to have discernment. Um, there is a lot of wolves in sheep's clothing inside the churches. Um, you know, there is no perfect church because there are no perfect people. Um, I we we all get that, but when you're talking about heretical error and just you know practices that shouldn't be that should not be and and outright sin um, within the churches and just doctrinal, you know, that they they departed for the faith from the faith. Um, you see that more and more. Um, and it's increasing more and more in the days that we're living in. Um, you know, that's why, again, the Church of Ephesus is called the Loveless Church. Um, they left their first love. and But the solution to that, the exhort or exhortation that Yahushua HaMachiah gives is to repent and do the first works. Um, so... Obviously, the warning is 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 there, um, and it's just interesting that now um, emphasis was such a thriving city, uh, even evangelistically, you know. Um, but now it's just you know the religion of the day over there now is 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 Islam. Um, but Yahuwah is still Yahuwah, Elohim is still our Elohim, and he and and Yahushua HaMashiach still sits on the throne, um, that we are called to bring the message of Messiah everywhere we go. Um, that's never changed, and that will not change. Now, um, again, if you're interested, just look up um, the church in Ephesus, look up the area, um, and, and all the other churches, for that matter, that we're going to be discussing in the weeks ahead, Yah willing. Now, you know, that's all I have for now. Like I said, we can go on and on and on. Um, you know, this is particularly interesting, you know, this journey. So I, I thank you for coming alongside, um, you know, just this, this whole journey of discussing the book of Revelation um, and that the, the way the Ruha HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, um, has led me to do it, you know, to take it slow, to unpack it because, the book of Revelation is very rich in symbolism and, and there is a lot to learn and a lot to, um, to look into, um, you know, and it's just, uh, I've been blessed, you know, just to be here. Um, and again, I pray that everyone had a safe and blessed new year. Um, you know, I pray, you know, just a word of encouragement. If you are not in Messiah, if you're not in Christ, 
you know, salvation is for today. Um, you know, the he uses the tool of repentance for you to come to him. But the message is clear. Christ died on the cross for you while we were yet sinners. Right? He died. He rose. He was buried. He rose again on the third day and now sits at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And he is coming back for his church. He's coming back for his assembly from the for the remnant. Um, and that is a fact. Another fact is that hell is very real and heaven is very real. And we are eternal beings. We all have we are made up of body, soul, and spirit. So um, those who think that we die and then that's it, or those who believe in reincarnation, that's also false and error. Um, and those who just believe that from dust we came, from dust we will, you know, go back to and we just would be dust and that's it. No, you have a soul. So where will the final resting place for your soul be? And there you will be conscious, not just your soul. You will be conscience, uh, awake, and in eternal torment and punishment in hell if you don't. And, and, and that's the truth. And people say, you know, that's the thing in these times. And people have said it. It's nothing new. Um, why would a loving God send a person to hell? Um, that is, first of all, you're sending yourself to hell because especially if you know of Messiah, if you've been told of him, you've been uh, evangelized, you've been, um, someone shared him with you. Um, when you stand before him, you're sending, like, so you're, you're basically rejecting him, right? I don't want to get too much into this, but you're rejecting him, so you're sentencing yourself. He's just passing the sentence, you know, if that makes any sense. But that's the truth. You know, you made a conscious choice to reject him. Or maybe you thought, well, let me just have more fun, or let me just do X, Y, and Z. Let me, let me. Um, that's witchcraft. First of all, do what thou wilt, you know. Or basically, loosely, I'm gonna do what I want with my life. And come to find out, uh, you said, oh, well, I'll just have more time, you know. I'll do it next week, or I'll do it next year, or whatever. And tomorrow's not promised to anyone. And then you die, and you wake up, and you're being judged. And um, the sentence is passed. And at that time, there is no second chances. There are no excuses. Uh, Messiah is going to let you know, you know, my servant blank or, you know, my people came and spoke to you about me. And what did you do with me? You know, um, that's a question, you know, I, I ask people, what have you done with Christ? What have you done with Jesus? And I make it clear, I'm talking about the Jesus of the Bible. I'm not talking about a Jesus that they made up, uh, a Jesus that is okay with their sin, uh, as long as they believe in him and, and maybe go to church every once in a while or whatever the case is. No, those who have repented from their sin, turned away from it and have turned to Messiah and who trust and believe in him and trust in him only for the salvation of their souls and those who obey him, um, those who follow him. So that's all I got to say about that. And I just encourage you. He loves you so much also. That's why he came and died for you. Um, that's why he corrects you. That's why he, he does the things that he does and he's merciful. Um, but again, we were sinners. We are sinners. And he still chose to die for us. He, he chose to die for you. Um, so I just pray again that that blessed you. And we will be discussing the next letter to the church, you know, in the series and again, you know, I just pray that um, the series itself is, is, is blessing you and that you're getting a lot out of it. Um, you know, again, this is not a huge following that I have, that the podcast has, but uh, I did I did get received some encouragement a few days ago that someone, uh, I think almost as 
for as long as I've started this podcast and the Lord put it in my heart to start it. Uh, I think it was around December of 2020 and that someone still listens to it. Um, so praise, praise y'all for that. Um, <laughs> that encouraged me at one person. Hey, uh, if you hear this, you know who you are. Um, thank you for your support. Um, please tell others as well. Um, you know, and you know, if you're saved, you know, tell people, continue to tell people about the love of Messiah and share the gospel, man, share the gospel and tell others, you know, other Christians that you may know, like, Hey, you know, check out this podcast. You know, it, it doesn't hurt. Um, you know, again, I'm not in it for the likes. I'm not in it for the listens, but uh, I am in it for the encouragement. I am in, in it to honor the Lord. And the more people that do get encouraged, that's awesome. You know, I praise, praise y'all for that. So the next letter that we'll be discussing, um, God, God willing, on Saturday will be um, to the Church of Sperna. Sperna. So um, I pray you would uh, come alongside me for that. And that will be the second church. And after the letters to the seven churches, that will wrap up the entire series on the book of Revelation. And then uh, we'll dig in a little bit into the book of Daniel um, regarding the visions and how they kind of all tie in as well. Um, in the end times, uh, in the study of ex eschatology, uh, which is the study of the end times and the end of things. So love you all and bless you and have a safe and blessed rest of the week. Love you all.